finally getting to talk about this virus today, I should say the virus represented by this virion, adenovirus. But before then, particularly since we didn't have a chance to have these all recorded, I wanted to briefly go over the tumor viruses and then the real tumor viruses. Polyoma viruses, this is SV40 and friends. Um, it's all about large T antigen. Again, whenever Stebbin asks you a question about SV40, the answer is large T antigen. Not always, but most of the time. Um, and again, these are tumor antigens. And the large T antigen is sort of a classic early protein, messes with the host in terms of turning on the cell cycle, and also is a regulator of both viral replication and viral transcription. So again, sort of a classic early protein, changes stuff the host happens, host response systems, and also is involved in replicating viral genome. Um, and speaking of viral genomes, the really neat thing about this viral genome is it's packaged in nucleosomes. So it's a really nice chromatin, analog chromatin-like template. So really nice system for studying eukaryotic transcription, eukaryotic replication. Big difference between the papillomaviruses and the tumor viruses is how their genomes are set up in terms of SB40, of course, is circular and has these transcripts that go in opposite directions. Papillomaviruses are also circular, but all the transcription is happening on one strand. And these papillomaviruses really are tumor viruses as opposed to the <clears throat> polyomaviruses, which only if you put them in really strange conditions will they actually cause cancerous growth. So take home message here, um, vaccinate, 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 and particularly vaccinate your kids, um, male or female, which I've done, both my girls, HPV vaccines. Uh, so any questions on this before I ask you one? Yes. Um, for the polyomaviruses or for the papillomaviruses? The papillomaviruses. Yeah, it's, they're binding, in fact, um, they're all binding to sialic acid or heparin, so basically glyc glycans on the outside of the cell. And also, um, at least for the sialic acid for SV40, that's really similar to flu in terms of what it binds to. Other questions? Before I ask you one, you've all got your clickers out. Okay. So let's give this one a try. See how everybody remembers from last time. Oh, and I can't, you can't use large T antigen as the answer because I put it in the question. Drat. Go ahead, tell each other what you thought. That's such a great way to study. <laughs> How to ruin the curve, shame them, yeah, that's it. 
ready to go again? Yes, no, maybe, go. See, I'm still aiming for the 100%. We didn't have 100% last time, so. Yesterday we had 100%. No, we didn't even class it. So Sunday we had 100%? <laughs> Three, two. So whoever likes to mess up my statistics didn't show up today. <laughs> so SV40, large T antigen, is a transcriptional activator of what? Activator of what promoters, what genes? Okay, do I have to pull, call somebody out? Well, giving people a chance to think about it or go back and look at their notes, as the case may be. No, I'll get, of course, I picked a name that I can't pronounce, but um, Chan Lianka Sok? Yeah. Yeah, so it blocks the late genes, exactly. Samuel Nelson, what, is it, what does it repress? No. Courtney Stout, what does it repress? Manny, what does it repress? <laughs> Think about it. We have the late genes. What are the other genes in SV40? Pardon? Late genes and early genes, exactly. So it represses the early genes because it's this you know, feedback loop. Yeah, Jacob. Pardon? D stimulates the cell cycle. So that would be the no, because it's not specifically doing it. It would be like a co-repressor or some other regulatory process. So if I had something like that in an exam, that would be an indirect process, whereby it would be stimulating. So an activator or an repressor means that there's a specific protein which is doing that job. So if it repressed transcription or activated transcription, that could be happening via LB or RB, not LB. Been growing too much E. coli. <laughs> okay, and then of course DNA helicase, and Jacob already answered that previous one. Okay, so <clears throat> today we're going to talk about bigger viruses, and no, I didn't print one of these yet, but I will. Um, and that's actually probably why I forgot to hit record on Friday. So I decided I would be good and not redo another 3D print. But we're going to have a cool 3D print. Oh, let me hide this, sorry. Um, We'll have a fun 3D print on Friday when George Kaysen gives our guest lecture um, because I printed adeno-associated virus. Um, so adenoviruses are even larger double-stranded DNA viruses. So we'll talk about even bigger ones on Wednesday, the herpes viruses, and then even bigger ones than that the following Wednesday because Monday is Memorial Day. So you're welcome to come, but I won't be here. Um, so again, there's this sort of whole process getting larger. Each time your genome gets larger, you're going to be less and less dependent on cellular machinery. So here, we're becoming more and more um, autonomous. The other big deal with adenovirus, this is where splicing was originally discovered. And also a lot about transcription was discovered in terms of the study of adenovirus. And we'll talk about that in considerably more detail. They also have these really fascinating satellite viruses that, again, I'm going to let George talk about on Friday. A couple of important aspects about these particular viruses. Alternative splicing, which is you know, how we have 
one set of genes, which turns out to be making a lot of different proteins, uh, as well as having those overlapping open reading frames. Just one way for genetic economy. Again, smaller is better, quote unquote better, for many viruses. <clears throat> then we also have alternative tailing, which most people sort of forget about as far as regulation of the messenger RNAs that you have for adenovirus. And because of this, you know, differential splicing and differential tailing, you end up with very different proteins. Not surprisingly, this is a DNA virus, double-stranded DNA virus, so it messes with the cell cycle. And we already talked about at least one of the proteins already in comparison to the polyoma and papilloma viruses already. So double-stranded DNA viruses, they need to regulate the cell cycle because otherwise the cell's not going to be making DNA. Uh, one thing that's very different about these viruses, they have terminal proteins. These terminal proteins are involved in dealing with the ends of the genomes. Ends of genomes are always problems if you have a DNA virus because usually the end of a genome, normal cellular replication as an RNA primer, that RNA primer is removed, and then you lose the ends of your genome. So we need telomeres in cells, but very few of these viruses have those things. Um, there are also these so-called inverted terminal repeats, or ITRs. We've talked a little bit about these secondary structures before. It turns out that these are also very important for the replication process and also for dealing with that particular end problem. So as usual, we'll talk a little bit about origin, i.e. disease, um, structure. The structure of these viruses is absolutely amazing, and um, some of you may have seen the videos that I pulled up right beforehand. We'll take a look at those a little bit later. Uh, we now understand that probably, at least close to the highest resolution of most virions at all, what the structure is of these particular viruses. Binding and entry is also really quite well understood. This bow uses both a receptor and a co-receptor. And then, you know, he puts them in red because these are the ones that are particularly special about these viruses. Transcription, um, transcriptional regulation in particular, which is both cellular transcriptional regulation and viral transcriptional regulation. But I could also put here messenger RNA production because that's the splicing aspect of things. Replication, again, terminal protein and these inverted terminal repeats, which is important. And then how they get out is pretty straightforward. Oh, before I forget, um, this is a really nice micrograph of adenovirus and this arrow up here points to the adeno-associated virus, a satellite virus, which again, George will talk about on Friday. Assuming he gets back from his fishing trip. So where do these come from? Uh, adenoviruses, there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of different adenoviruses, um, up to 100 different kinds. 50 serotypes, we talked about serotypes when we talked about the flaviviruses earlier on. This is just different antibodies reacting with the proteins that are present on the outside. And these are all split into six different subgroups. Most of the time, we're going to be talking about adenovirus 2 because that's the one that everyone's been working with <clears throat> in the lab. There are, again, a number of other adenoviruses as well. Not surprisingly, because this regulates the cell cycle, Misregulation of the cell cycle is, of course, what you see in cancers. So these can also serve as tumor viruses if you, just like SV40, completely overload the cell, um, give far too much of these. Um, these were originally found in adenoid tissue, which is why they're called adenoviruses, but they are not the common cold. Um, what's common cold is what kind of viruses? Rhinoviruses, exactly. So when I did post a neat article about some rhinovirus or anti-rhinovirus drugs that are in development um, having to do with assembly of the particles. And so that's, a, that's on D2L under discussions. Probably most important as far as what we know about these um, adenoviruses is that they're really great tools for understanding splicing and promoters. This was old school. Um, and these days, also gene therapy. It turns out that these are very good at getting whatever DNA happens to be inside the capsid to the nucleus and inserting that into the nucleus. And so lots of people, in fact, I think it's something about 
30% of gene therapy is actually using adenovirus vectors and most of the rest of it adeno-associated um, virus vectors. So that's where these guys come from. What do they look like? Uh, they're really quite complicated, maybe why I didn't decide to 3D print them. Uh, lots and lots of different proteins, um, just as far as the capsid is concerned, let alone everything else which is on the inside. There are 11 different proteins that are just making up this particular capsid structure. Uh, the T number is a pseudo T equals 25. And who's up for pseudo? Sung Jo Chin? What's pseudo mean in terms of symmetry? Pseudo symmetry? Roslyn? Pseudo symmetry? What's, um, what does pseudo symmetry in terms of pseudo symmetry mean? That P. Exactly, having more than one different protein. Um, and in fact, in this case, 11 is way more than one. Uh, but the main ones are the hexon and penton proteins. Um, hexon protein is the hexamers, which fit in between the pentamers. Um, penton is actually made up of three different proteins, the base fiber and knob. And because these are icosahedral structures, there are 12 of them. Um, this particular cryo-M is actually kind of hard to find, these five-fold axes. Here's a nice spike sticking out. Here's that next spike sticking out. How do you get from this spike to that spike? You count one, two, three, four, five. So h squared is five squared, 25, k is zero. So you have a pseudo t equals 25 structure. And we'll see that again in a little bit more detail. The other thing that I wanted to emphasize as far as these structures are concerned is this double beta barrel structure. And I also forgot to bring my <coughs> models for these. Um, I do need to print this structure, though, one of the things on my list. Uh, this is one of the monomers that come together as a trimer. Each of these have now the hexon subunit up the top here. But this beta barrel structure down here at the bottom is conserved in bacterial viruses, archaeal viruses, et cetera. And one reason that we think this is one of the sort of fundamental folds that you see in capsid proteins. Um, these are the figures from, I think, actually the other textbook. These are some more recent ones. Um, this is from my colleague uh, Vijay Reddy at the Scripps Research Institute um, in 2010 did a structure of the adenovirus. Here you can see in even higher detail each of these, like this green one, this yellow one, the blue one, the orange one. All of these are hexamers and then the pentamers here in lilac at the end. But their main thing that I wanted to point out here is not so much these hexons and pentons, it's these extra proteins in between, the dark blue here, et cetera. So these sort of seem to serve as glue holding this whole process together. So it's not a nice, again, regular quasi-equivalent icosahedra with one protein, many, many, many different proteins. And even more recently, there was yet another structure. Um, this is from type 5 adenovirus, one of the ones that they use a lot for the gene therapy purposes. And again, lots of these glue proteins um, in between, which are not present um, in your regular icosahedral symmetry, just sort of, you know, again, really holding everything together. Um, the other thing which was a big deal about this paper, at least eight years ago now, all of this was done with cryo-electron microscopy. Usually to get this kind of high resolution, you have to have x-ray crystallography, but people are getting better and better at electron microscopy, as we're talking about a little bit on our Friday literature club. Uh, trying to get a very high resolution structure. And sort of the example down here at the bottom is where just one of these proteins, I believe it's this you know, glue protein here that goes in between. Uh, you can see the electron density, which is the, you know, a little hard to see, sort of the chicken wire on the outside here, and then the structure mapped into it. And this is um, really pretty amazing. And you can see that with this chicken wire, the only thing that really fits there in this case is an arginine. With this chicken wire, the only thing which would fit would be a tyrosine. So you have a very high 
resolution structure and a good understanding of it. There's yet another one last year was published again, slightly different um, adenovirus. This actually is a complete, um, it's a deletion of one of the particular proteins that is used for gene therapy. Um, this is what that looks like in the cryo-EM and the reconstructions thereof. Um, and just because this is so much fun, we'll take a quick look at some of the movies, which are here. This is looking at that whole structure. A um, little harder to see here, but we have pentons right here. There's a penton. Here's a penton. And then all of these extra proteins, you also see really nicely the trimeric structure that you have in each of those individual hexon proteins. Might be a little bit easier to look at here. This is where you have just one of those faces. Again, penton here, penton down here at the bottom. Let me move this a little bit out of the way. Um, and then you could also see on the inside these glue proteins, which are helping to hold the whole process together. And it's just an example of one of these very, again, high resolution cryo EM structures is this one. The electron density is in gray and the polypeptide chain is in red, and you can see that these are matching extremely well with each other. So structural biologists get all agog about this and go, wow, cool, isn't that great? Um, but we, because of this, we do really understand very, very well exactly where each of really the atoms are in these adenovirus structures, which if you're gonna be using it for gene therapy and you want to know exactly what you have is always a good thing because if you're gonna be putting this into humans, it's a good idea to know exactly what you're putting into one particular person. So yes, these are beautiful from the point of view of understanding the structures, but people also like to use them as art. Um, so any idea at all where this is? And I'm not gonna put anybody in the spot for this. Where, where yeah. Right, it's by, actually it's by the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, this is a particular harbor known as Cold Spring Harbor on Long Island in New York, which is the site of one of the leading labs in molecular biology um, for a long time led by a bigoted racist pig by the name of Jim Watson, um, but um, has been really fundamental in terms of understanding a lot about molecular biology and a lot of the studies of molecular biology they did there were the studies of this particular adenovirus. And so this is part of the artwork that they put together on their sewage treatment plant. So <laughs> this is what's sitting on the edge of their sewage treatment plant. Um, the, one of the neat things about Cold Spring Harbor is they have a clock tower. Um, and on their clock tower, instead of north, south, east, and west, guess what they have? C. A, T, and G. <laughs> so I don't think they talk about directions on campus in terms of, oh, I'm, I'm a little G of you know, the, the other lab. So I don't think that's the case. So <clears throat> let's now zoom in a little bit and look at this particular structure. It is, as I mentioned, 11 different proteins. So it's ridiculously complex. I'm not gonna ask you to remember all of them. I certainly can't remember all of them. The ones that we're gonna talk most about are these guys, that we have the nice boxes or circles around. Um, this one is your hexon protein. Here's the penton, particularly the penton base. And we also have the penton fiber and knob at the end. And then this terminal protein bound to the end of the genome, which is also packaged in a lot of viral proteins. And so the, the key here is that we're not talking about cellular nucleosomes anymore. We're talking about viral proteins packaging the viral genome on the inside here. So what does this genome look like? Depending on the adenovirus, again, we've got hundreds of these different adenoviruses, 30 to 36,000 base pairs linear double-stranded DNS genome with a protein, this nice orange box, attached at one end and at the five prime end of each of the two strands of the genome. If you look then at the DNA sequence right next to that, it's 
CAT, I don't remember that, you don't have to remember the structure, CAT, CA. Um, important is that this is now an inverted repeat. Inverted repeat means that you have the same sequence on the opposite strand. So you go all the way over to the other end, CAT, CAT, CA. And the T I had to add here because it's a typo in the textbook. Um, so again, these inverted terminal repeats, they're about 100 nucleotides long. So they didn't write all of them out here. But these inverted terminal repeats, again, it's, you've got one strand that has one sequence from 5 prime to 3 prime. And then on the opposite strand, the opposite end, you've got a sequence which is um, identical to that. And what that means, of course, is that, pardon me, this end of the genome is going to be complementary to that end of the genome on that same strand. And we'll get back to that a um, little bit later on. The, yeah, so they circularize when you actually end up doing replication, exactly. So the, the panhandle model to get a little bit ahead of ourselves. Okay, we're all happy with genomes and structures? We're all ready to pull out our clickers again? Judging from the f scores, I think you have something to talk about. So go ahead. <laughs> I didn't talk about it. No. You can think about it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm forcing you to think. This is just, I shouldn't be allowed on a Monday morning. <laughs> We're getting more quiet. It's time to vote again. Judging from these numbers here, I probably should cut off at 30 seconds the second time around. Uh, have people, huh. or wait till we get 100 percent and then just stop it immediately. <clears throat> Five. The suspense is just ridiculous. <clears throat> so why do people think polio? I heard people muttering about it up the front here. A genome replication, so primer. <clears throat> 
VPG muttering up here. So a protein primer for replication. What about um, bacteriophage T7? What's the primer used by bacteriophage T7? Uh, where there's a, the primers are all RNA for bacteriophage T7 and for FIX174 to some extent. Well, actually, it uses its DNA primer because of the A protein which cuts. But that's, um, it only works with a <clears throat> replicative process, and then you end up with that only bound temporarily. Um, Ebola is an RNA dependent RNA polymerase. That's quite different. Nobody liked SARS. So it is, they are protein primed. Yes, Jacob. Um, so would primer for replication be a good idea in terms of making a table, in terms of comparing all of the different viruses? I think that would be a very good idea in terms of adding it to a table, in terms of thinking about what to study. OK, so yes, it is um, polio VPG. So <clears throat> we'll talk more about replication in this you know, ITR structure um, in just a minute. But first, you need to get that genome inside the cell. Um, this also is a nice review if you're putting together a table in terms of what things bind to and how they get inside the cell. Um, I would say that would be a nice column to have as well. Adenovirus right here. Um, binds to receptors on the outside of the cell, goes through endocytosis, we have changes in pH, and then the actual capsid, which has been slightly modified, is transported all the way to the nucleus, and then the DNA is released at the nuclear membrane. What does it bind to? Again, ridiculously creatively named the Coxsackie and adenovirus receptor because that was how it was originally found. Um, that binds to the very end of the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, penton, the penton knob, again, sticking out at the very end. The penton base binds to integrins. So this is a really nice example of what we call a co-receptor. You need two different proteins in order to get entry to take place. Once you get inside the endosome, there's a proteolytic cleavage that takes place. That's a viral protease. We haven't talked about it. If you're interested, we can look up exactly which one it is. And then that process, the viral protease, which is activated by this lower pH, helps the virion, which is now modified, to get out of the endosome. And that virion, once it finally gets to the nuclear membrane, there's a second viral protease which is activated that then degrades the capsid and allows the DNA to come inside the nucleus. If we look at this receptor and co-receptor binding in a little bit more detail, here we have the CAR protein interacting with the knob at the end of the penton fiber, and then these integrins, which then associate with the penton base. And this is Again, really not uncommon that you have multiple receptors for different viruses getting inside the cell. Um, they want to you know, make sure that it's the right cell that they want to get into. And we talked last time about susceptible and permissive cells. So susceptible cells have the receptors, and permissive have all of the replication machinery on the inside that the virus needs. Um, and the larger and larger genomes, more complex, more of its own proteins and genes it brings with it, then more and more cells are going to be permissive for the replication of these particular viruses once they get in. And this is partly why these adenoviruses are so heavily used. So what does that genome look like once it finally gets in? Again, there are about um, 30 to... <clears throat> 36 kilobase pairs in size. Unfortunately, here they label it from 0 to 100. Um, this is just the percentage of the genome that you have that's been entered in there. You've got early genes and late genes. Um, there are a bunch of promoters, actually seven different promoters for these early genes, one and only one promoter for these late genes. Lots and lots of termination sites. 
and also a couple of RNAs, small RNAs. People you know, get excited about small RNAs these days. Small RNAs were known literally 30 to 40 years ago from these viruses, but people thought there were just only viruses that were involved. So let's look at these. It, this seems ridiculously complicated, but it's really not that bad, trust me. Um, so first, all of the early proteins and the early genes. They are expressed uh, the very beginning, E1A. You know, it's got a little bit cut off here. Um, and E1B, we're going to spend most of our time talking about E1A and E1B here. Then there are E2 proteins that encode DNA binding proteins, terminal proteins, DNA polymerases. Uh, these E2 proteins um, should sound vaguely familiar. We've talked about E2 already in terms of what? Who's next? Who's my next victim? Um, Nicole? Pardon? E2 proteins? Just, just last lecture, we oh. talked about the... Um, there was no recording. <laughs> that is not recording. <laughs> That's it, yes. Interact with RB, usually. Binds to RB, which does what? That's so it's transcription via the. Jacob, what do you think? Yeah, well, what, what, what does RB normally block from functioning? The E2F, the E2 factors, which are important for regulating what genes? The E2 genes. This is how E2Fs were originally found, because they were regulating these E2 genes in adenovirus. So everything you need to know about molecular biology you can learn from viruses. Of course, why do you take molecular biology before you take this class? No. Um, so. <clears throat> So these are the, the E2, um, E2 regulated proteins. And then um, all of the late proteins, let's actually do this, um, are regulated from this single promoter, also called the major late promoter. Surprise, surprise. Again, the virologists being ridiculously creative in their names. Uh, major late promoter, which transcribes starting right here and then gives you all of these different proteins. And again, not surprisingly, the late proteins are going to be your fibers, your hexons, your pentons, et cetera. So um, exactly what you expect. And all of these extra little glue proteins that are involved in putting together the <coughs> capsid. Um, I mentioned these small RNAs. These small RNAs here are actually made by RNA polymerase 3. Um, Alex Chow, what's RNA polymerase 3 usually do? No, I'm down to the bottom of my list. I'm going to make a new list. Uh-oh. We can do one of those on Wednesday. Okay, so anybody, RNA polymerase 3, what does it normally transcribe? tRNAs. So short RNAs, again, <coughs> excuse me, not surprisingly. Um, these then regulate PKR which again, we've talked about a little bit before, protein kinase stimulated by double-stranded RNA, <coughs> which is a classic antiviral mechanism, some of which works through the interferon response. Um, so these small RNAs, again, they're inhibiting this double-stranded RNA, which usually will shut down translation, which of course is not what we want to have happen. So here, <coughs> One thing that is hopefully obvious is all of these arrows here have gaps in them. I think actually it's every single one of the messenger RNAs made by adenovirus is spliced. Um, so it's not surprising that splicing was originally found in adenovirus. Uh, but the classic example is actually from the late proteins. So this is just a cartoon of the genome down here at the bottom. Again. From the, this is just one of the strands, you know, 5 prime to 3 prime end. If you look at the messenger RNA, which is made for the hexon protein, 
Why the hexon protein? That's the messenger RNA that makes the hexon, the protein which is most common in the capsid. So you have the most of that particular messenger RNA. You find that it's got one sequence here, but then three little sequences attach to that messenger RNA, which are very separate relative to the genome. So how do people figure this out? Um, the main mechanism that they use is something called the R loop, which I talked about last term and probably Dr. Singer did <coughs> previous terms. What you do is you hybridize RNA to DNA. So you isolate messenger RNA, and then you take that messenger RNA and bind it to the DNA. Now, in bacteria, what you would have in that case is because bacteria usually don't have splicing, whenever the RNA binds, you'll have a loop of single-stranded DNA where that RNA was. And this is your classic R-loop structure. If, however, you have splicing that takes place, there are pieces of that messenger RNA that are missing in the DNA. So if you have your RNA, which is supposed to be this dark line here, it's a little bit hard to see, so black here followed by green here, and this is literally what you saw, what was seen, I should say, um, by the labs that were working on this in the electron microscope was a thick line and a bunch of thin lines. And that particular thick line had these loops that came off of it. And the only way they could explain these loops was that there was something missing in this final RNA. There's also this little piece at the end of the RNA that doesn't match. What's that? The poly A tail hangs off the end. Um, and so that, of course, is not going to match the viral genome. Uh, but it was this structure, um, and this is literally from the paper of Phil Sharp's group, that probably is the reason that he ended up getting the Nobel Prize. Um, Rich Roberts, who was working at, give you one guess where he was working at the time. Not OHSU. I showed you a picture of the place already. Cold Spring Harbor Labs, exactly, um, was where he was working. <clears throat> um, Phil Sharp was at MIT at the time. Um, so Rich Roberts at <clears throat> Cold Spring Harbor basically saw very similar structures to this where bits and pieces of RNA weren't matching with the rest of the genome very well. Um, now the neat thing that Rich Roberts was able to show that, in fact, Phil Sharp couldn't, was that these pieces of the DNA genome down here, these pieces were chopped into pieces, smaller pieces, using restriction endonucleases. And restriction endonucleases had just been discovered at the time. And Rich Roberts then decided, well, actually, um, people keep asking me for all these restriction endonucleases. Um, why don't we start a company to sell them? So in fact, he did. And he's one of the founders of New England Biolabs. Um, but it was so it's the di discovery of all these restriction endonucleases and also the R-loop assay, which allowed them to discover um, splicing. At first, everybody said, oh, splicing is just for these crazy viruses. Who cares? And then, of course, we found that many of our genes are alternatively spliced as well. So let's look at which of those genes are particularly important. You know, those late genes, yes, you can get lots and lots of them. But <clears throat> the early genes, and particularly E1A, which is what we did talk about um, last time in lecture that didn't get recorded. Um, <clears throat> this is the main protein which is involved in activating the cells which otherwise wouldn't be undergoing DNA replication. Um, this <clears throat> protein is made as two differentially spliced messenger RNAs, but the main thing here is just like what happens with large T antigen, with <clears throat> the regulatory proteins that you find in papillomaviruses, interacts with RB, interacts with P300, interacts with TBP. So RB is going to be important for regulating the cell cycle, TBP in terms of activating genes, and P300, which is a co-activator, also important for <clears throat> these processes. Particularly important is this PRB interaction. Um, which is basically sort of the same thing that we've seen sort of almost ad nauseum now. Uh, normally, RB binds to the E2 factors together with 
histone deacetylase complexes in the normal cell cycle. You have cyclin-dependent kinases that phosphorylate this. The E2 factors go ahead and activate S phase. If you have E1A, which is made, again, as the very first protein when adenovirus infection takes place, this binds to RB and allows the stimulation of the E2 genes. And the E2 genes are, of course, which genes? important for DNA replication. So the terminal protein, the DNA polymerase, etc. There is, however, a problem with this process. Um, and particularly E1A is really good at stimulating transcription, but it also turns out that stimulating transcription, one of the things it stimulates transcription of is P53. Uh, P53, if you make a whole bunch of it, what happens? You end up with apoptosis. Do we want apoptosis to happen if we're a virus that has just infected a cell? No. We really don't want that to happen. So you have another conveniently named protein, E1B. And what does E1B do? Suppress apoptosis, suppress apoptosis, get rid of P53. So it's E1A and E1B in concert, which turn on the cell cycle, and suppress apoptosis. So those are the you know, only regulatory proteins that we're going to talk about. There are other regulatory proteins in adenovirus, but again, we're not going to talk about them as far as the rest of the course is concerned. I do want to talk about replication that you were asking about. So um, yes, we have these terminal proteins. Terminal proteins serve as primers. That's how they get hooked up to the end of the genome. Instead of using a tyrosine, these actually use serines. Again, those have a nice convenient OH because DNA polymerases need OHs in terms of being able to extend. So you have normal genome, again, that comes inside the nucleus, terminal protein attached to the five prime ends. First thing that happens is there's the single-stranded DNA binding protein. Um, this is a viral single-stranded DNA binding protein now that basically serves as a helicase. It binds so well to single-stranded DNA that you always are going to have a little bit of breathing. Again, we talked about this last term in molecular biology. So how many times is that molecular biology today? Um, so with that breathing, particularly the ends of DNA, you have a little bit of single-stranded DNA. As soon as you have that little bit of single-stranded DNA, when you have the very high affinity single-stranded DNA binding protein from the virus, what that does is it starts to pull the two strands apart because as soon as that single-stranded DNA is there, the single-stranded DNA binding protein binds to it. A little bit more breathing happens, another single-stranded DNA binding protein will bind to that. This single-stranded DNA binding protein is also highly cooperative. So once you have binding of one, you'll get binding of a lot more. What that does is it starts to pull the two strands apart. Once you pull the two strands apart, you now have the terminal protein which has a C that gets attached to it, the viral DNA polymerase. Again, all of these are the E2 proteins in the virus. This then binds to the terminal protein and will replicate its way through the end of the genome, gets to the other end. And absolutely normal DNA polymerase going from five prime, because that's what you've had it here, all the way to three prime, the end of the genome, single-stranded DNA binding protein, which is serving as a helicase, goes to the opposite end of the genome. Now you can get this strand, which will dissociate again with the single-stranded DNA binding protein, replicate over the other end, etc. This works, and works actually reasonably well, but apparently not fast enough for genome replication. So now this is when those inverted terminal repeats come in. So because this strand here, this end, can base pair with this end. This end here can also base pair with this end. So that means that this particular DNA, this end, can base pair with that end. Again, these can now base pair with each other. And just like you have over here, that single-stranded DNA binding protein will help pull the two strands apart. Now you have a polymerase, a terminal protein, which can replicate this genome all the way around and get to the other end. And so this gives you an exponential amplification as opposed to just a geometric amplification. So going from 1 to 2 to 3, now you can go from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16, etc. And it's only because you have these 
inverted terminal repeats that you can have this amplification. If you didn't have inverted terminal repeats, you could still replicate, but it wouldn't replicate as fast. Okay, you people happy with, with that? Okay, so now let's talk about fun splicing. So <clears throat> fun splicing, again, we have our major late promoter. This was the promoter that was used to discover RNA polymerase II and most of the factors that were involved in transcription and transcriptional regulation. So major late promoter at the 16.5 position. No, I don't expect you to remember that. Um, but in the middle of the genome um, is transcribed. You have a cap that gets put on. This cap is now all a cellular cap, which gets put on normal capping processes. So it's not a viral capping enzyme that makes these three short introns, oh, sorry, exons, excuse me, these various different <clears throat> introns now, and then different possibilities for polydenylation. And polydenylation is CTSF, polybinding protein, et cetera. So as you transcribe, it will cut or not cut at any given position. And in that process, you end up with multiple different RNAs in five different classes. So you've got some that have a poly A tail here, some here, some here, some here, some here. And a lot of that has to do with splicing. And as we all remember from our molecular biology course, eighth time probably today, um, is that splicing and tailing are going to be co-transcriptional. So as this is being <coughs> excuse me, transcribed, you're going to start doing splicing. And so if you've already started to splice, for instance, for these guys, you're never going to have a chance to make the poly A tail at this early position. So it's really very splicing dependent. So if you start splicing at the 5' prime end here, you're skipping this stuff out. These guys are never going to get tailed. So splicing and tailing are very closely connected to each other. And the splicing for these guys, you always get splicing of these three, the header part of your messenger RNA together, and then various different three prime ends of your messenger RNA, all of which are going to give you slightly different proteins. The so-called tripartite leader is really important for getting that messenger RNA out of the cell and is also very good translational initiation. But translational initiation is cap dependent, now exactly as you'd expect for normal cellular translation purposes. So splicing, tailing, and then the tripartite leader sequence. How we make some of these ridiculously large numbers of proteins. Need to get out. Um, there are <clears throat> basically two proteins that are involved. I love this one. It's the death protein, um, also known as a, the E3 proteins. Um, they're made early, but also, as we've talked about before, for some of these holins and proteins that you have to get large amounts of, that um, the death protein you just need to get accumulate enough of before the cell undergoes <clears throat> cell lysis. And so that process um, of the E3 protein um, you start making it early, but it has to be accumulated throughout the whole cell process. Um, E4 is a P53 independence process that seems to lead to apoptosis. Now, E4, like E3, is actually something which needs to accumulate. First, you think apoptosis is a bad thing. You remember, that's what E1B does, is blocks apoptosis, until things happen to be very late in virus replication. Late in virus replication, if apoptosis is turned on, you release a whole bunch of virions. And these, of course, are these highly complex and brought together virions. So it's all about a, a timing process in terms of making first enough viruses and not having the, I should say, enough virions, not having the cell respond, not have the cell undergo apoptosis before you have a bunch of virions, but after you have a bunch of virions, one way to be released is to stimulate apoptosis, which is then going to burst open the cell. So apoptosis is 
bad at the beginning, but good at the end. Okay, happy, not happy, good. So let's talk about some, some cool things that people can do with adenoviruses. Um, one of those I mentioned very much at the beginning is the gene therapy um, process. So getting a particular DNA inside a cell and then you know, being transported very well, again, through this capsid process all the way to the nucleus. Um, these gene therapy <coughs> vectors, people will call them, are missing E1A and E2A because um, you don't want the cell to be rapidly going through a cell cycle. You don't want to be causing some kind of cancer. Usually these gene therapies are using very large quantities of virus. Um, also, these are being used in terms of producing vaccines um, because they're really good ways of getting DNA. Now, partly why they're so useful is people also attach this major late promoter to whatever gene it is that you're interested in. So that is one of the best transcribed and, of course, because that leader sequence also very well translated protein. Also, people have taken what they've understood studying adenoviruses, again, not surprising because they've been studying them for so long, Cold Spring Harbor, among other places, is also now trying to use adenoviruses as what are called oncolytic viruses. So oncolytic viruses are now, instead of the virus making cells grow cancerously, now you use the virus to try and kill off cancer cells. And the way that most of these <clears throat> are made is lacking E1B and E3B. And so basically, if you don't have E1B, you're not suppressing apoptosis, right? Because that's basically what E1B does. But it's suppressing apoptosis by suppressing the activity of P53. Um, if, however, you have a cell which is already lacking P53, now, E3B is going to turn on apoptosis. So the idea is if you can get a adenovirus into a cell that is lacking P53, you can cause it to die due to um, the presence of E3B. However, if there is P53 around, as we talked about, we talked about these SB40 last time that didn't get recorded, uh, most cancer cells are mutated in P53. So the idea is this is targeting now cells that are mutated in P53, and if they're mutated in P53, they're going to be cancer cells, so at least in theory you can kill them off. This has never worked actually particularly well, uh, but um, really cool idea, I think. You have a stretcher question? No, sorry. That's fine. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so the <clears throat> last thing I wanted to talk about, almost done, how did, how did I do this? Talk really fast, I guess. Uh, <laughs> or run out of people on my list to torture. Uh, so we mentioned, you know, adenoid tissue, et cetera, and most of the stuff we've talked about today has been adenovirus type 2, which again is adenoid tissue and sort of <clears throat> upper respiratory tract. On the other hand, uh, there are other adenoviruses which actually have turned out to be really problematic, particularly in basic training for uh, military recruits. Um, adenovirus 4, adenovirus 7 in particular have been a huge problem in terms of you know, lots of mostly young men in very close quarters. Um, so cause all kinds of disease, and it turns out that this is mostly an intestinal process um, rather than a, <clears throat> excuse me, um, airway process. So uh, turns out adenoviruses, I forgot to mention this before, can get into pretty much any epithelial tissue, and of course it's, you know, epithelial tissue is everywhere, so not just in the lungs but also in the guts. And it turns out that um, you can vaccinate um, against adeno-4 and adeno-7 actually um, through, through the intestines. So it's just a pill. Um, and one of the, it's just amazing. I saw the statistics here. It's you know, over 150% disease reduction um, by just you know, giving 
all the military recruits these um, two um, pills. And I'm particularly excited about this because this turns out to be another potential vaccine platform. Um, vaccines that work orally are, in fact, kind of hard. Um, you probably have, you know, had been jabbed far too many times because most vaccines are going to be um, an injection. Polio is oral, but that's not surprising because it's polio is normally a gastrointestinal disease, so that would make sense here. Um, so adenoviruses, um, being able to use these adenoviruses in terms of being able to get genes into the gut and then also can then potentially use them for vaccines is really useful. And a company that I've been trying to collaborate with for a long time actually has been trying to use these. Um, the other nice thing about these adenoviruses is they're very, very stable. Um, not surprisingly, because of all these extra bits and pieces that are holding that capsid structure together. So they're actually very stable as pills and dried and all kinds of other things as well. So it's a really neat um, vaccine platform. So the, the, the question here for those people who, who, who didn't hear is that it, it only seems to be two and five that need the co-receptors. Um, and what about the other ones, four and seven? The answer is I don't know, but I'm pretty sure they just have that one receptor that they need to get in, which again will be another reason why um, these could serve as, as pretty good ways of both for gene therapy, getting genes in, but also then for um, vaccine purposes. Yeah, I'm not absolutely certain about that, but I'm guessing that that's the case. Okay, more questions? Last chance. Okay, one more to finish off. Turn it on, go. Is it going? Yes, now it's going, sorry. And this is the end, go ahead and talk with your neighbors. Apoptosize, I like that. That's good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> E1B, we'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>